Vibrant, vibrant, vibrant music teaching. Proven and practical tips, strategies, and ideas for music teachers. You're listening to the Vibrant Music Teaching Podcast. I'm Nicola Canton, and today we're talking about lessons from yoga for piano teachers. You can find the accompanying article that goes along with this episode at vibrantmusicteaching.com slash 160 or colourfulkeys.ie slash 160 if you're not a member. Hey there beautiful teachers, great to be back with you again for another episode here. I hope you're having a fabulous week so far and enjoying your teaching, enjoying life. We're going to be talking about yoga today and its role in my piano studio and what I think us teachers can learn from yoga. Now, it's a bit of an interesting topic and you may straight away have thought, I'm not sure if this one is right for me, I'm not into yoga or I'm not into any of that new agey stuff or I just don't know what she's talking about, how can this apply to a studio? I want you to stay with me. These are very much universal lessons. They're not going to be lessons on how to do crow pose (laughs) or anything like that. I'm not talking about specifics to do with yoga. I mean, we will go into some stretch stuff, but it's not something where you need to be a yogi to enjoy this episode or to get something out of it or to understand it, right? I'll make it accessible to everyone. I have sort of organized this episode loosely, going from less to more woo-woo or um, new agey or whatever you want to call it, right? I hope that you'll stay with me the whole way through, but I'm going to start with the more grounded, more, I don't know, mainstream, although yoga is pretty mainstream at this stage stuff and then we'll get to the mind spirit side of things towards the end of the episode. So I hope you'll stay with me for that but do know that that's the sort of progression we're going through here. That's how I've organized it. So we're going to start with the stretch side of things and then talk about body awareness and then get to mantras and mindfulness and that side of things at the end. Before we even do any of that though, let me fill you in on my yoga journey so far. So the reason I started yoga in the first place, well, I actually had done it a couple of times as a teenager, but really I hadn't done much of anything, just a class or two here or there. But about five, maybe even, it's maybe even longer than that, but I'm not sure. Anyway, so at least five years ago, I was experiencing a lot of back pain and I've always, I had always had some back pain really since I was a teenager I would go through these bouts associated with cramps or not and just really really tough periods where my back would go into complete spasm and I'd be stuck in bed or be forced to go out and about the place because I had things to do but like have to be so so careful when I was turning around or moving in any way and really just being in so much pain and putting on those heat up packs you know the the ones you get in there like a sticker and you put them on your back to try and relieve some of it it's normally lower back but it could also be neck and all of these things and so I'd gone through a few of these I think because I was working on stuff around the house we would have just been finishing up some of our redo of the house we're in right now before the current extension if those of you who know about that but this was back when we were fixing it it was very broken and and we had tidied up a lot of that and so I was lifting things and moving things around nothing strenuous and nothing with bad technique just I think my back and my core was so so weak that even with lifting stuff with correct form and with having very strong legs and arms to support me I didn't have that core strength and so I would throw my back out really easily. So I was realizing that this was an issue and not something that someone in their mid-twenties at that stage should be experiencing with their back. I mean, really ridiculous. So I looked into yoga at that stage. That's why I got into it. And when I first got into yoga, 
I was very resistant and just completely blocked out, really. All of the mindfulness, mantra, all of that side of things. So that's why today's episode, I've organized it that way. Those of you who are really into this stuff, I'm not, you know, disparaging any of it. I'm not saying, oh, I have to make excuses for that side of it. I just know me six years ago, I would have been rolling my eyes and moving along. So that's why I've structured it like this. But I was really in it for the stretches and the movement and it did help. At first, I almost made things worse because I went too gung-ho into it as I tend to do with things. And so I did a lot of it straight straight off the bat and didn't have the core strength to support it. But as I got used to it, it became this daily practice that really made a difference for me and for my health and my back and all the pain. And within a few months of doing yoga pretty much every day, I didn't have any more back pain after that. And I still haven't until now, touch wood. You know, something happens. I now have that strength to support me, I think, and so I can do normal things and not completely throw my back out and be stuck for three to five days. So that was my journey with yoga. And I knew, I mean, I saw the value of it because I had that benefit from it. And it was so clear to me that that was what had changed for me, that the yoga was what had done it, that I was perfectly motivated to stick with doing yoga every single day, but I was still completely ignoring the other side of things. So that's where we're going to start. We're going to ignore the other side of things and we're going to look at a few stretches. So yoga lesson one of three. Stretches that I think are particularly beneficial for us as pianists and to use in your lessons with students. So this can be integrated into the warm-up stuff that we've been talking about a lot on the podcast recently and developing that routine and having specific stretches on hand for when a student or you have a specific issue. Let's start on the small side. Let's start with fingers and wrists. One of my favorite things beyond the standard finger stretches, so like pulling back one finger at a time, you know, uh, rolling your wrist, beyond those standard things, those are great and they're a great thing to do. One of my favorite stretches is something I would call lion pose. Now again, I'm not a yoga teacher or anything, right? So you can correct me if I'm wrong or you can just ignore it. But I call this lion pose because it's associated with lion breath, okay? So this is where you sit on your knees with your knees wide about mat distance if you're on a yoga mat. So if you can imagine that or like a little bit wider than hip width, your knees wide, toes together. Okay. And you're sitting up tall. So it's not folded down like an extended child's pose. If you're familiar with that or like a surrender, it's, it's sitting up, but on your knees. You can also do this very similarly uh, with cross legs or any way of sitting on the floor, really. And I imagine you could adapt this for table use if you're not able to sit on the floor. So what you do is you bring your palms to the ground, but you turn your hands around so that your fingertips are pointing towards you. You have your palms on the ground, and then you turn. So your fingers are pointed towards you with your thumbs um, on the outside. Pinky fingers, fifth fingers on the middle and your palms on the ground. And this is an immediate stretch for the wrist. I find it really helpful and beneficial for my wrists. A way to take it a little bit further is to move in a very gentle circle. Now, very gentle. You're going to move slightly back, slightly around, and then try reversing that circle. If any of this is hard to follow, right, the stretch side of things is not particularly podcast friendly, maybe, although hopefully you can follow me. You can find the written instructions, of course, and some links to various YouTube videos that demonstrate these poses on the article. So that's colorfulkeys.e slash 160 or vibrantmusicteaching.com slash 160 if you're a member. So that's one of my favorites. There are tons of wrist and shoulder hand stretches from yoga that you can draw inspiration from. So the next area we'll look at is for your arms and shoulders, general arm health and warming those up. This is what you would call volcano pose in yoga, which is one of the most basic. So you're going to stand up tall 
and stretch your arms up towards the sky. So you can have your feet planted together or hip width apart. Stretch your hands up to the sky like you're holding a big beach ball up and overhead. And then lean gently over to the right and lean over to the left just to get the stretch through the sides there. And then bring your hands together and slide them on down to your heart. Very simple, but it does warm up the arms and get those shoulders moving as well. And then the last area I'd like to look at is your back, because as I said, that was my original inspiration for starting yoga, and it's a huge benefit you can definitely get from it, and something that I don't think we value enough in our piano work, right? That our back is holding us up, and it's involved in our playing, and we just neglect it, and we slump down or even if we sit up tall we sit up too straight we don't think about our back as having muscles that are involved in all of the movements that we do at the piano so one great thing for your back is certainly things like cobra poses or upward facing dogs that kind of thing and those familiar with yoga will know those but actually the one i think is more useful for piano lessons and piano teachers is a simple forward fold to halfway lift. So here's what you're going to do. You reach down towards your toes. I'm always careful to say towards because although I'm super flexible and I can always reach my toes, I know for many that's a pain point or a point of annoyance when people say reach your toes and you're like halfway down. It doesn't matter how far over you go, right? You just fold over for your version of a stretch. So you reach towards your toes, completely folded over, but standing up. And then you can take a moment to sway side to side and then raise up so that you make like a seven shape or an upside down capital L shape with your body. So your back is the horizontal line. You're making a straight line with your back. You can have your palms on your thighs or on your shins and your legs are the bottom part of the seven or the vertical line. And then fold back down once you've found that position and got a little bit of a stretch there, fold back down and then roll up the whole way, stacking your spine vertebra by vertebra. Okay, so those are our three stretch areas. I certainly think taking on yoga and trying lots of different stretches can provide you with enormous inspiration in terms of the warm-ups you do with students and the solutions to when they're feeling anxious or when they're having pains in certain places or anything like that. Of course, if they're experiencing real injury or harm to pain, like other than just general soreness, actual pain, you should definitely refer them to a physio or another professional. Now let's get into the slightly less physical, practical side that I think is an even better lesson and a more rich area for teachers that, as I say, I resisted at first, so I totally get the resistance if it's there for you. But first of all, let's talk about body awareness. So this is lesson two, and this took a long time to sink in for me, for sure. But once it did, it really has made a big difference to how I think in general. And it's an ongoing process, I think, so I don't think it's something where you can resolve, right now I'm going to see my body differently or I'm going to become more aware of my body and then it's done and you're better. (laughs) There's no cure here. But I do think many of us move through the world without noticing what our bodies are doing. We're not paying attention to the fact that our lungs are breathing and our heart is beating and our muscles are all working together to achieve certain things. Many of us just take our bodies for granted, right? Even if they're especially if they're at their healthiest, but even if they're not, we just sort of motor on and keep going and it's basically fine, but we're not paying any attention to all of the work that our bodies are doing. And I know it was this way for me. Gradually, over time, yoga has given me this better awareness of the impact the movements I do have on my body and what it is doing for me, what my anatomy is physically doing for me. I also think this awareness in the right frame can be really beneficial for everyone's mental health and in particular for how we perceive ourselves because 
we have totally bananas view of what bodies are in our society, certainly in the quote unquote Western world, right? And I think really in most of the world, from my experience with pretty much every other culture, we have this view that they should look a certain way and it's all in service of us kind of thing. Like our bodies are somehow in service of our minds in this really. I don't know, destructive way and we have to keep poking and prodding and trying to make it be the way it's supposed to be without ever acknowledging that it's it's doing all of these processes so well for us and it's so much in service of us already. So it's hard for me to convey this idea, but I think this lyric does it much better than I ever could, at least it does for me. Maybe it will mean the same to you from Regina Spector, who's one of my favourite singers, and she has a song called Folding Chair, and the lyric goes like this. I've got a perfect body, though sometimes I forget. I've got a perfect body, because my eyelashes cut my sweat. And then she says, yes they do, they do. So, whether you're familiar with this song or not, maybe that means something to you. Maybe it does, and maybe it doesn't, but I always come back to that myself, because Sometimes we do forget. Yet you might not have an actually perfect body, but what she's saying is it's perfect, or what I interpret it to mean is it's it's pretty close to perfect. It's doing all of these amazing things, and it's designed, or created, or forged so well that your eyelashes catch your sweat, your body moves to help you achieve things, and create and perform and do all of the things we do and that's pretty incredible. Okay so now it might sound like I've come gone completely off track. What are we talking about? Isn't this a podcast for piano teachers? So let me bring it back around for you. It might sound like I've gone beyond the scope of what piano lessons are or piano teaching is but I believe it all comes back together. When you take care of your body because you know what it does for you, when you have this awareness over how amazing it is that it does all of these things, and when you think about it as, oh my gosh, my eyelashes catch my sweat, I think it can help you to be less self-conscious about, and many of you will remember this from being a teenager, even if you don't feel this now, but you know, you sit at the piano and you're supposed to plant your feet on the floor why to make a tripod? I mean, that as a teenager to me, I was my teacher never really pushed me on it, but I was never really secure in that way because that's taking up so much room and oh my gosh, I'm supposed to be this delicate little thing. Not that I actually thought those thoughts, but I do think there's a lot of different associations with taking up space or moving in certain ways or even asking yourself, how am I re- moving my wrist right now? What is my arm doing to support this? I think if you become more aware of your body and and as a tool almost, or all the tools that are involved in it, it can help you to see it in a more healthy way that helps you to accept it when you're at the piano and actually analyze what is this movement, what is that movement, how can I support this better with other parts of my body without going and shaming any part of you that has to support this movement. Anyway. That might be a step too far for you. That might be something where you're like, I don't even know what she's talking about. But I believe, and I do believe, especially if you're a woman in this world, you probably know what I'm talking about here. And I think it's something we can pass on to our students in a much more healthy way. How do we do this? This is where I come back to yoga because I think even if you never do any yoga, but you just listen to a few lessons from someone who's not a like, Yoga for weight loss, bikini body, nonsense yoga teacher. I'm not not talking about that, okay? But someone who's more focused on the other side of things. If you just listen to the way they talk and maybe listen to some of their meditation practices, I think you'll see what I mean in the way we frame things and talking about the work that our bodies are doing. Okay, you still with me? Okay, (laughs) let's go on to lesson three. This is the last one. It's about mantras and mindfulness. And this is the side that I will have resisted completely for almost the entire time I've ever done yoga. But 
for me, this really hit last year. <laughs> 2020. Let's talk about it. So I had done yoga for years by that stage and it was always really a body thing for me. I wasn't against or judging or anything like that. The mantra side of things, the intentions, any of the the spirit or the mind side of things at all, but I wasn't really interested in it. I didn't think it was applicable to me. <laughs> that sounds so harsh, but that's kind of how I thought about it. And honestly, I just completely tuned it out. If any of you out there are also not interested in sports in the slightest, you might know this feeling from when you listen to the radio and the news comes on and you listen to the news and then suddenly the end, it's the end of the sports broadcast and like they play the bing bong at the end or whatever jingle they have to end the thing and go back to ads or go back to the regular broadcast and you sort of wake up, even though you've been driving the whole time feel like you've just woken up and you have no idea what just happened because you've tuned out that sports segment so much. Maybe it's a new segment for you. If you are familiar with what I'm talking about, that is kind of how I felt about the mindfulness talk in, in the yoga that I did. I would basically be able to completely tune it out and not pay any attention and my mind was on other things. Hello, the opposite of mindfulness. And then I'd Realize they were talking about moves and, and be moving on to the next thing. So this kind of changed for me last year and I started to find that side of things more useful to me when I went into panic brain. Everything scattered, everything just a lot more full of anxiety and stress than it had been before. So there are two things that I would like to share with you from, from what I've learned on that side of things from yoga. First is the mantra or intention side of things. I, in January, started something along these lines for myself. So I, January was tough. I'm not going to lie to you, January was hard. It, nothing happened. Um, thankfully, my family, everyone I know is still healthy and everything is still pretty good. And I do recognize that. But January, I don't know, we'd headed back into lockdown. We'd had a few weeks off for Christmas and we've had a lot of lockdown here in Ireland, if you're not aware. And we had a few weeks off for Christmas. We went back into lockdown. We're back down to 5k of our homes, nothing, anyone, et cetera, et cetera, right? And it just felt harder. It was the whole of the pandemic has been difficult in various different ways, but this was a real slog. I really felt like, oh my God, nothing is fun right now. And some of you may be just thinking, yeah, that's just the January blues. No, I love January. January is usually my one of my favorite months. I find it so fun. I don't mind that it's dark all the time. I don't mind the poor weather, anything like that, but this time it was tough. So anyway, I decided to try this idea of setting an intention mostly because I had a spare diary. I accidentally ended up with a spare one, long story. And so I was like, I'm just going to write a sentence of how I want to feel that day or what I want from that day, each day. Now, I was very clear with myself internally that I didn't have to do it every day. If I didn't want to, didn't have to. I wasn't setting any kind of New Year's resolution. I didn't want any kind of expectations on it. I was like, I'm going to try this, see how it goes. I don't care if I stick with it or not. So it was very loose. And I just started each day writing, today I something. So here's a few examples. Today I take pride in my work. Today I feel calm and kind. Or something like, today I will go for a long walk. It could be something actionable as well. It was very loose, but it was just something that when I get scattered in my brain today, I'm going to come back to this and try to refocus on it. So it was like that intention or that mantra. And I found it really helpful. Now, did I continue it? No, I come back to it every so often. I did it for most of January, at half February, almost every day. And now I'm doing this randomly when I feel like it. But when I have those kind of scattered feelings, I know it's a tool I can come back to. So again, that has nothing to do with teaching. Although if it sounds appealing to you, if it sounds like something that you might find helpful, try it. 
What's the worst that can happen? You feel a bit silly? I mean, who cares? Hide it under your bed if you like. If you're embarrassed by it. Or, you know, put it on your wall. If you're not embarrassed by it, you don't need to be. But outside of that, I've been thinking about how this might apply to our students and our teaching. So some of the statements can very easily apply to something smaller. It doesn't have to be an intention for the day. It can be an intention for a piece, a playthrough of a piece. How many of your students launch straight into a piece without forethought, without any intention? I think it would be a fun experiment to have them say aloud what they want from that repetition, from that playthrough, from that performance, whatever it is. Have them say, this time I will X aloud, just before they start. See if it makes a difference. The last lesson I have to share with you is about breathing. Coming back full circle to simplicity. This could almost have gone in the stretch section, but I believe that the breathing side of things for me is more useful as a mindfulness tool, as a, yeah, a thinking tool, a power of thought tool, to come back to the breath. It's often the best solution. So here are a few different breathing options that you might try. One simple one to work on the breath is to breathe in for a count of four and out for a count of four. One, two, three, four, exhale. One, two, three, four, like that. One good uh, focal point for this is to draw a box of light or a square of light in your mind in front of you. So you can do this with your eyes closed or open. And with a young student, I would try tracing it with your finger in the air so that they know what you're talking about. So it'd be great for students who are anxious or who need to focus or just as an experiment, as a brain break. So you're drawing each side of the square on your one, two, three, four picture going down, across, up across and then it just goes around like that as you're breathing in and out. The next one is crocodile breath. Come to lie on your stomach and breathe into your belly so that it you feel it rise and fall. This is great for that body awareness thing I was talking about and the more healthy way of looking at something like your belly, right? It's not this thing we need to trim and tuck and tone and all of this. It's this thing that has other functions and we breathe into. And so coming onto your stomach and just breathing deeply into your belly and feeling it rise and fall has an incredible calming effect. So if you're angry or anxious or you're finding your breathing is shallow and up in your chest or your student is any of those ways and you think this would be useful, give it a try. Next one is called, in yoga, it's called Ujjayi breath. And this is where you breathe in and out with an ocean sound. So you put the tip of your tongue on the roof of your mouth and you make, you have a soft restriction at the back of your throat so that you make a sound. So I don't know if you'll hear this through the mic, but we'll try. One way that Adrian from Yoga with Adrian YouTube channel talks about this is like as if you're fogging up a window, but you don't open your mouth to do it. You imagine that, ha. Huh, that you fog up a window with is kind of that feeling but with your lips closed. This I find really really useful whenever I'm getting distracted especially in yoga but also in other things. If you're trying to focus on something or you're trying to clear your brain a little bit just walk just do whatever it is you're doing just paint whatever. Coming back to this breath because it has that audible sound I find it really useful. And then last one is breath of fire or Kabbalah Bhati. And this is where you have a sharp exhale. So it's through your nose, but it's a sharp, that kind of exhale, kind of like a sniff, except, you know, not into a tissue, <laughs> kind of like you're blowing your nose. So you take a di big, deep breath in, place your hands on your belly and you breathe out so that your navel draws sharply in. Okay, and you do that over and over again in a row. So you're like sniffing and sniffing and sniffing, and the inhale is just passive. It just happens. You don't you don't focus on it. Again, there's links to videos for all of this stuff if you're curious about it. Those are just a few options for breathing exercises. There are tons out there, 
But all of these types of breathing things, they really do help to alleviate some of the scatty feeling and to bring your attention back. And I think they're great tools to have in your tool belt, even if you never use them. For your students who do experience performance anxiety, general anxiety, stressful moments, or who get easily frustrated with things, having these tools is just another way to be able to help them. So I would love to hear if you do yoga um, or if you don't and what you thought of my lessons today from yoga and what lessons you tend to take from yoga and put into your piano studio. Let me know in the Vibrant Music Studio Teachers group on Facebook or in the comments under this episode at vibrantmusicteaching.com slash 160 or colorfulkeys.e slash 160. I'll see you there. Vibrant Music Teaching members get five new games or resources at least every single month that keep them inspired and wanting to become a better teacher each and every day. If you want to join the best community of teachers online, you can go to vmt.ninja and sign up today. Mm-hmm.